All right. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the session. You know, as we think through mission-driven organizations, one of the major advantages that they have is investing over very long time horizons. Um, the opposite side of that coin is that, you know, the, you have to live through then many, many, many more short terms. Um, and, and so that, that can be quite the challenge. And, you know, in the next half hour or so, we're going to sort of talk about how to frame and sort of prepare for those things. We will have time for Q&A, and please feel free to write any questions that you have um, into the, uh, the, the chat box, and, and we'll, we'll have time for those at the end. As Ahmed said, my name is Chris Adkerson. I'm based in our St. Louis office, and I co-lead our U.S. not-for-profit practice. I spent 25 years with Mercer uh, working with not-for-profit clients on the types of issues uh, that we're going to speak about today. Thanks, Chris. And um, hi, my name is Craig McBride, uh, based in Glasgow. Um, I kind of lead consultant for uh, endowments and foundations here based in the UK. Interestingly, I've been slightly less than Chris in terms of tenure at Mercer, only, only 23 years at Mercer, so a uh, relatively short period. Um, but yeah, so just uh, moving moving on to the next slide, and as Chris says, you know, as, as investors, you have a very long term horizon, um, and you know you can set your long term strategic objectives and your overall strategy. Um, but the question is, you know, do we care about short term volatility? Clearly, you know, the long term is a series of short term periods. And in this chart here, we're just showing you know the, the global corporate profits and how they've grown over time. And clearly, over, over a long term, you can see a clear trend there. But there are um, you know, periods of short-term term volatility. And the, the one um, you know, case we're showing here is just in 1997, you know, the Asian crisis. And you can see just that drawdown. But clearly, there's other periods of um, extreme volatility as well. Interestingly, you know, the Asian crisis actually did take you know, four or five years um, for, for profits to, to recover. So, you know, how we define short term as well uh, is important, and we'll come on to that. But I think philosophically, you know, for investors, uh, maybe one of the first questions in this topic is, you know, do we care? And for, for some investors, actually, you know, if you're taking the long term horizon, maybe philosophically, you, you take the view, well, actually, we'll just stick to our long term plan. And maybe, you know, the best action is no action during those short term periods of volatility. However, for other investors, Perhaps the view is actually we do care and we do want to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves and also you know manage risk as well. So we do we do want to react to short term volatility. And I think you know we certainly strongly believe for the latter, it's really important to plan ahead then if that's the case. And the next couple of slides are just going to talk about you know the overall framework that we believe in in terms of how, how you'd actually address that and then be, be equipped um, to prepare for. Uh, short-term volatility when it arises. Clearly, for the vast majority, if not all, uh, long-term investors, there's a clear mission um, and objective set, and you know, then you build your long-term strategy um, around that in terms of which asset classes you invest in, etc. I think then moving through, you know, making sure you have a proper framework in place to react to these short-term uh, volatility opportunities, as I say, it's important to set out, you know, your beliefs, your policy, and your process. And we'll go into this in more detail in the next couple of slides. But briefly, you know, in terms of beliefs, it's really about what you might do when those opportunities present themselves. Being clear on that at the outset, as I say, having a plan, ensuring you're all aligned. Um, you know, on those beliefs is important. Then, you know, in terms of thinking about policy, about, it's about who makes those decisions and indeed, you know, how much of a position you're, you're wanting to take, you know, within your, your overall risk um, tolerances. And then thinking through onto the next step is really about process. You know, how is, the, how is that actually implemented? Who is responsible for implementing? And indeed, is speed important as well? You know, what kind of time frames are you working to, and how, how does that get done within those time frames? And then ultimately, you know, that feeds through to your portfolio and the positions you may well take against that long-term strategic benchmark that you have in place. So, as I say, if you're going to react to short-term volatility, it's all about planning in advance and thinking through these important steps. 
So first of all, just thinking about beliefs in, in more detail. And I think the first aspect is really just thinking about, well, how do we define success? If we do believe it's important to react to short-term volatility, how do we define that in terms of what we're looking to achieve? You know, is it in reference to your long-term strategic benchmark or indeed your absolute return target that you've set? Um, or maybe, for example, you know, relative to your peer group um, measuring success, and depending on what the answer to that is, will actually impact on how you change your portfolio to that short-term volatility. Another aspect is defining your horizon. So whether you know short term is three months, is it six months, or perhaps even longer, you know, it could be over 12 months in terms of how you define that short term period. And that's important because it also feeds through to your you know, governance framework then. And the answer to you know the most appropriate governance framework may well be different for reacting to you know over a three-month period compared to, as I say, um, longer term, like you know, 12 months, for example. And I think also when it comes to beliefs in that philosophy, it's important to set out what you're actually aiming to achieve. Is, is it just reacting to perhaps um, you know, more extreme dislocation in markets? So if I think back, you know, whether it's the global financial crisis or indeed more recently with the pandemic, is it those extreme cases where you're looking to react to market dislocations? And by by the nature, then you know, those, those uh, opportunities, if you like, will be less frequent. Or perhaps you know you're looking to be more dynamic in a more frequent basis, um, and and seize opportunities as and when they arise. So I think it's important to set out in your beliefs what it is you're actually looking to capture, um, and then thinking that through as well, making sure there's alignment there. And then the the, the third aspect of you know setting your beliefs is setting clear risk tolerances. And you know we've set out here a number of different risks. It's important to understand with your circumstances what risks are important. So, for example, is mark-to-market risk important? Uh, possibly, it's less important. You know, maybe more your focus is on you know capital loss or default risk, or indeed you know your liquidity. You know, is, is a liquidity risk important, or do you need um, sufficient liquidity in your portfolio? And again, that will come down to your circumstances. But it's important to be you know, clear, um, given your, your circumstances, of what those risks that you're focused on. Perhaps, uh, Chris, you just want to expand on policy and then process. Thanks. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that this is really important. I know, um, you know, for us, we, we just published something not too long ago entitled Investment Beliefs, the Governance Bedrock. And this paper really kind of went through these particular things. And we've helped clients sort of build those statements. They can often be, you know, two to three to four pages, but they can really kind of help outline this. And it's really helpful, I I think, particularly when there's transitions. So as new committee members come on, it kind of helps that. Um, so, you know, I think it really helps prepare you uh, for those things. And, and, and in particular, that risk tolerance. So I worked with a client, for example, to sort of build out these risks. And we ended up with 11 of them and it wasn't just enough to list the 11, but we actually then defined them and then what the mitigation steps we were taking in the portfolio was. We did so that we would be prepared because again, with these risks, you, you can't eliminate them, but you can sort of mitigate them and knowing what you're doing, I think is really important. So for example, two that you had listed, illiquidity risk, right? Um, so they started with this saying, well, what is illiquidity risk? Well, it's the risk that we don't have cash when we need it. They actually took it a step further and said, well, actually, it's it's not really having cash or or the access to turn something into cash when we want to, right? Because we might have equities in the portfolio that we can turn into cash, but if it's down 30, 35%, we may not want to. And so they kind of defined that risk. And then they said, okay, well, how do we mitigate that? And the answer was, the first thing they thought about for, for this particular organization was, was more sort of enterprise risk management, where they said, we as the investment committee probably need a better handle on what our organizational cash flow needs are, right? So what, what does it need from the portfolio? Um, and so that sort of dovetailed into a, a better um, sort of communication with the administration of the organization. You know, that applies to some uh, more than others. So higher ed and healthcare, probably it's a much bigger issue than maybe foundations where you're just grant writing. Um, then they looked at what other things they might need, like cash flow from private markets. So we know that you're going to get capital calls. And so we did the modeling for what the cash flows would look like, you know, out, out five years in estimates, but provided them with uh, those numbers. 
Um, and then we said, okay, well, we probably want to make sure that we have a certain percentage of those in cash and government bonds. Um, and so they created a liquidity st statistic where they said, you know what, we want to know what our cash flow needs from the organization are, what our probable cash needs are from private markets. We want to make sure we have so much uh, in cash and bonds to meet that. They ended up turning that into liquidity ratio so that they know they had, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 months worth so that if something happened, it allowed them to sort of stay in the market. The other thing that we that they ultimately decided to do was to have, you know, a quarterly liquidity report. So something we provided to them quarterly was, you know, here's we kind of broke liquidity into a couple of things like monthly, quarterly, uh, annually, and then and then uh, beyond one year. And kind of break it into the liquid, semi-liquid, illiquid categories, or as I like to think about it, you know, money you can get to, money you can plan for, and money you can't touch. Um, and that was helpful. And then the last thing we did was on an annual basis, we've begun stress testing the portfolio. So they would say, okay, here's our liquidity today. What would, what would happen if markets were down 25%? What would happen if markets were down 40%? What would that liquidity statistic look like? And so that's just really helpful that that for them they've thought through this so that when times do get ugly, um, they know that they that they have that sort of covered or at least they've thought about it. Another one is something like headline risk, where for them this is a little more touchy feely, where it's sort of like the risk that an investment we made ends up in the paper, which generally you know is is sort of negative. That's kind of the way we, they view it and. Um, and generally, it shows up, frankly, from uh, from managers hired. So a manager has a blow up, that kind of thing. And so they, they sort of define that. And then they said, OK, so what are we going to do about it? Rigorous manager due diligence, which they absolutely lean on us for, but the committee participated in. They also decided that, you know what, we we want to make sure that we have conviction in our managers. So we're only going to pursue something if we really have conviction as a group. And then the last one is really about position sizing. So knowing what our position sizes were and limiting it was a way to sort of uh, mitigate that headline risk. I say all of that because having this belief statement is imperative in terms of trying to figure out the what's next um, and being able to take advantage of those, um, those dynamic positions. So the first question that we get to is often, you get to the committee meeting, we've seen markets like they've been over the last four or five months. They wanna talk about what's going on and what to do about it, right? What are we going to do, right? Because that's the sexy thing. That's the interesting thing, right? We're going to overweight this. We're going to underweight this. Well, I would argue that's sort of at the end of the end of the train. And what comes first is really um, who, who's going to do it, who's responsible. Then it's how and how much, and then finally what. But you get to that who's making the call. And so if you see here from a governance perspective, you know you can kind of think about those couple of things we have mentioned there. The board, the investment committee, the investment team or staff, you know, that I kind of think of is, is, is internal, right? And those, uh, those are sort of internal to the organization. Otherwise, we could, we could outsource some part of this to uh, either a delegated OCIO or to our investment managers. And that's more of an external. And what's interesting about that is that, you know, the internal is oftentimes more top down, where the external is sort of bottom up. Um, and so I, I think, you know, to expand on that a little bit, as we kind of look at this particular graphic, I think, you know, you can kind of see this, I broke it out in two places where the internal and the external, if we're talking about internal, it, it's, it's organization led, right? So it's those folks who are internal inside of the organization, um, often top down strategic. In other words, you know, you've built sort of your IPS out. I would say oftentimes your, your, your focus is on asset allocation. So for example, we like domestic equities or inter, non, you know, uh, international equities or emerging markets, or we like large, or we like small, or we like, uh, you know, um, domestic or, or um, foreign bonds, or we like credit or not. Th those are kind of the things and we typically would see clients move around say, well, we want to be overweight by, you know, three points here or two points here or those kinds of things. And so it's more of a top down driven by asset allocation focus. Whereas externally, what we're talking about often is more much more uh, about execution. So there we're outsourcing, let's say, to your investment managers. In this case, what we're thinking about is maybe we've got an allocation allocation to global managers and we allow them to make the decisions for us, or we have multi-cap strategies and allow them to make the uh, the decision for us. That requires much more flat, flexible mandates in the investment policy statement. And of course, 
there are some issues that go along with both of these. Um, so for example, on the internal, there's the question of speed. And you know, oftentimes with these organizations, you're gonna meet four times a year, markets move quickly, they're moving what seems to be even quicker. Uh, and if you have sort of a short horizon on your, your tactical moves, you don't really have a lot of speed, right? Because you're just sort of governed by when is the next committee meeting, when are we gonna do that? And so that can be a particular issue. Articulation, um, I, I, that's really about spelling things out in policy. So there's a lot more uh, bookkeeping, if you will, that goes into uh, sort of a top-down focus because you're always sort of changing that policy, which then gets reflected in the investment policy statement. The third one is turnover. And turnover really is about committee or organization turnover. Um, and we certainly see that as a particular issue. You know, one of the great things about the organization is um, I, I would argue that the time horizon of you know, the institution is very long. The time horizon of your investment com committee chair or your investment committee members is often short, right? And so you've got this turnover and it's not uncommon to see it, you know, uh, a, a particular committee that you worked with for a while that has a bias towards large cap, small cap, non-US, US, whatever it is that they wanna be tactical around. And then your next committee as it turns over six years later they may not have exactly the same views. And so you're gonna see those sort of mitigate over time. The last one is group dynamics. And it, th this is probably my favorite um, and, and in part because um, it, it's one that as consultants or, or frankly, people on committees, we see this all the time, right? Where um, you have committee members who have differing opinions. It's worthy of a story, but I was working with a client, this is a higher education institution in uh, fourth quarter of 2008. And you can imagine fourth quarter of 2008, things are melting down, markets are going and things are, uh, you know, a lot of people, frankly, are, are, are really scared. And in the room are two very different people um, who led the committee. One of them was a private equity manager who obviously thinks very long term, you know, he's, his holding period is 10, 12 years. And the other one was a hedge fund manager. And for him, long term meant a week. Uh, and so one of them is arguing, I'll let you pick which one, that the world is melting down, that we have to raise all this cash, everything is going terrible, we need to liquidate the portfolio. And the other one is saying, you know, it's, it's okay, we're gonna, we have a plan, we're gonna stick to it, things will turn around, we'll reinvest, all that kind of stuff. And as you can imagine, um, you know, that, that conversation got pretty heated to the point that it, it almost ended up in a fist fight um, <laughs> across, the, across the table. And so, while I haven't seen anything sort of that um, dramatic in a while, I think it's clear that group dynamics present sort of an issue uh, with sort of that uh, committee-led um, tactical uh, nature. From an external stand standpoint, if we think about hiring managers to do that, there is the question of oversight um, because clearly the committee is still responsible for investment managers you're gonna to have to look to them and make sure things are being done. So that that is still, that extra layer is there from an oversight perspective. Uh, the second one is evaluation. And, and we say that because you know, if you hire a global manager and they do great, let's say, is it because they pick the right countries or the right stocks? Um, and so you have to kind of go through, did they get lucky? Is it good? All that kind of things that you normally have to go through, but it just adds an extra layer of um, sort of evaluation. The third one is diversification. Um, that can be an issue because you know, frankly, if I hire, let's suppose five global managers and all of them at one point decide we want to be in emerging markets and be heavy there, then your entire portfolio is skewed in that direction. And so you're going to lose some of the diversification benefits that you maybe wanted to put in with your strategic asset allocation by letting them do that. And the last one then is really about cost. Um, clearly, you know, if, if you want to pursue sort of a bottom up approach, you're not passively managing any piece that also comes with additional costs. And so um, that's P, that, that's part of it. Um, on the, the, the next slide here, um, I'll go a little more in depth about the internal guidance. Um, this is really a responsibilities matrix. It's something that is, you know, this one is pretty, pretty basic. But we found putting something like this into the investment policy statement helps with that articulation piece that I uh, worry that I kind of talked about earlier. What you see here is we kind of break it into a couple pieces. This one, again, as I said, is, is really basic, but it lays out sort of strategy, management, and operations, and then by function at the top across the columns. 
and then by uh, responsible partner there down below. And we've seen these get a lot more granular with some clients. So for example, they want you know uh, to spell out who has ultimate control of the strategic asset allocation, who has ultimate control of dynamic asset allocation, where are those ideas coming from, even so much as the you know manager selection and manager weights, for example, how much are we going to allow you know a manager to be used? Which, if you're doing bottom up, can certainly be uh, be part of that. So that's definitely something that we could you can look at trying to add into your investment policy statement as a way to sort of help you uh, get through uh, sort of the management or articulation of the the, the uh, internal process. Now, from an external standpoint, um, you know, when you hire an OCIO or a delegated service, um, they're sort of in control of that dynamic asset allocation. So they're going to be the ones who are making that choice. They're going to have uh, this manager selection uh, often uh, that's incumbent upon them, which creates then another layer, if you will, of the ability to be tactical. Then there's room for opportunistic investing. And really what we mean there is more you know, new things coming onto the market. The market is always sort of evolving and it's certainly a little easier for them uh, because they're always sort of in the marketplace. A delegated partner um, can sort of add that as we add on new asset classes as, as things evolve. And the last one is timing, um, which is probably the biggest thing that you're outsourcing uh, is the ability to say, look, whenever you feel like it's the right time, you can do it. So your committee's not having to sort of um, so, sort of uh, be guided by that. I think that was one of the speed was one of the issues we had with the sort of top down. Now, from an investment manager standpoint, I, I think you're, you're looking here is you're trying to sort of go from the specific to the to the general. So it's regional allocations versus global. So if you're thinking domestic equities, international equities, emerging markets, um, wherever you're located, or hiring global managers, right? So you're allowing them to make that decision. All cap versus specific mandates. So large cap growth, large cap value, as I mentioned, growth value versus uh, a flexible core manager. Investment grade versus flexible credit or, or multi-asset credit. Uh, within hedge funds, looking at single strategy names or multi-strategy hedge funds is a different way, or even funded funds is a way to implement that. And then finally, public, private uh, versus unconstrained. And that, that sort of gets into the opportunistic piece that I was kind of going, talking about earlier. You know, there's obviously you can break out, specify how much you want in public markets and private markets. And there's sort of a new breed of managers that, that are sort of bridging that gap, right? So they're, they're saying, look, we're going to start with some things that are public, some things that are private, and we'll hold them as they go from private to public. And so that's certainly another way to do that. So uh, folks like Tiger or um, or Viking are some of the names that are doing that. And so that's one way to kind of think through the, uh, the, the external piece. The next question I mentioned was how much, uh, which is really how wide are your strategic um, shoulders? And I think that's a um, that's a question that everybody sort of has to get through is that, okay, great, we're going to do something. How much do we do it? And I think you can build that into your investment policy statement as well, but how far you're willing to go uh, away from your strategic uh, policy, your strategic asset allocation, because at the end of the day, the further you go, the more likely tracking error there is to that, whether it be positive or negative. Um, the, the next question, the next issue with with process is really about what are the issues and as mike tyson like i think was quoted as saying everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face um and remember my fist fight story that i told you about right so there were some things as we think about both of those both of those gentlemen were right over their perspective windows so if you were only thinking about one week uh, in the middle of the fourth quarter of 2008 liquidating was was something you certainly could have done if you're thinking much longer term, then, then actually adding to equities was probably the right thing, right? So having those things, we know we are emotional creatures that there's going to be five, seven, 10 people in a room trying to make decisions that are best for the institution, but we're all guided by that emotion. That's where, as I said earlier, building out that investment belief statement and going through these risks and kind of spelling all of them out is really helpful because when you get punched in the face, then you have, okay, but here's our roadmap. So here's what we said we would do. So you can delegate some of that discipline, kind of what we just talked about. The other thing is you can build in automatic triggers. A lot of times within investment policy statements, you're going to work on a specific rebalancing policy that says, hey, here's our target. If we get so far away, we're going to rebalance. Or you can say, you know, as a committee, and I don't know these work great, but you could say something along the lines of, look, 
Uh, if the S&P hits, I'll make a number up, 3,800, that would trigger us to do something. If credit spreads get to you know, 600, that would tell us that we should do something. But importantly, you need a communication plan so that everybody knows exactly what that plan is. Um, and then you work around the constraints, which we talked about earlier, are often just about liquidity and safety um, as being the two sort of uh, big issues that you kind of have to work around and, and be sure you're aware of. So that kind of sums up that that process as we go from beliefs to policy to process. Uh, but I think now is probably a good time to sort of talk about, OK, so here's what we're seeing in the marketplace um, today. Thanks, Chris. And um, yeah, so just as you say, for the, the last four or five minutes of our section, just focused on so how do we see the market? Um, and what, what we're showing here is actually the US dynamic asset allocation views. Um, you'll be aware we do have our, our global DA views and specific uh, views, DA views in, in specific regions. Uh, so there might be some slight differences, but uh, here, here we're showing the US. And thought, first of all, just you know, focus on equities and you know, in terms of our dial there, you can see, you know, broadly a view on equities at the current time is broadly neutral. But that said, you know, within equities, there's some interesting um, notable observations to make. And the, the chart at the bottom here, we're showing the, the blue line, so the, the price earnings ratio. So, you know, the price you pay for those earnings for US equities, um, you know, based on a 10-year average earnings. And, and you can see there uh, against the green line, the green line is kind of representative of developed equities, excluding US. You can see there's been some quite some dispersion to the far right, you know, at the current time, um, US equities um, perhaps looking more overvalued compared to, you know, non-US developed equities. So, you know, perhaps worth considering in terms of your overall US versus uh, non-US uh, developed equity split there. Um, and in terms of outside of developed equities, think about emerging market equities. Actually, you know, in terms of the valuations for emerging market equities, we do think they're starting to look attractive, but it is offset to some extent just in terms of you know the uncertainty, the geopolitical risk and uh, macro risks as well at the current time. So overall, our, our view, despite kind of the, the valuation basis of emerging markets overall, we're, we're fairly um, uh, broad, well, broadly neutral on EM equities at the current time. I think perhaps actually, um, given the kind of broadly neutral view on equities overall, perhaps um, fixed income's a, a bit more interesting. So, Chris, would you mind just covering fixed income? Sure. Um, so, on fixed income, you know, there's there's quite a bit here. This is the USDA dials at the top. I think the, the global are, as, as um, Craig said, a little different. U.S. Treasuries um, have ticked up a little bit, in part because you know, as we 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 look at um, you know what's going on with rates, uh, clearly that's a a big issue. Central banks in U.S. Uh, and Europe are raising rates to deal with inflation. We're beginning quantitative tightening across the board. Um, in fact, the U.S. Fed is is uh, meeting today, um, and, and a 50 basis point increase is expected. We're expected to have that that neutral rate or interest rates raised to 2.8 percent by the end of um, 2022 in the U.S. That's 10 25 basis point hikes, which is pretty um, pretty substantial. The ECB is expected to start raising rates in July and, and fully raised by an 80, uh, 80 basis points by uh, year end. The U.S. aggregate bond index, for example, is down 9%. That's its worst start, start ever. Um, the 10-year Treasury uh, is um, is off to its worst start since 1788. I saw that from Deutsche Bank, and I thought that was that's a long time. Um, and then finally, the global aggregate, uh, and interestingly enough, there are just 100 negative yielding bonds in the index now. There were 4,500 at the at the peak, and so you can just see that rates have certainly moved up across the board. Um, some things that we like still tips, uh, which we have been a little overweight on, now coming down as break evens have headed up. Investment grade credit um, uh, weakened up a little bit as you see moved to the left there, in part because, as you can see there, both investment grade credit spreads and high yield spreads remain pretty tight. Um, and so if you're thinking about the you know, rough waters of, of uh, economic conditions going forward, it makes sense to kind of lighten up on credit. Securitize, still a fan of. And then finally, in the U.S., um, increasing duration. We've been underweight duration for a while. Um, and as the shape of the curve is kind of flattened out, it kind of tells you that, um, you know, at that point, it's, it's, I won't say it's safe, but it's certainly uh, a better risk return profile to go ahead and, um, and, and sort of move out um, and, and unwind some of that short duration position. 
Thanks, Chris. And then just as we've talked about already, and Ramit mentioned in his section, just in terms of you know the, the, the level of concern around inflation, and you know it's on pretty much everyone's agenda, uh, given the, the current environment. Um, on, on this slide, just briefly looking at the type of asset classes you could consider to build in some uh, extra protection into your portfolio from uh, an inflation perspective. And what we're showing here, if, if I focus your attention to the bottom left there, um, you know, asset classes that may well provide kind of short term. Uh, protection against inflation, well-known ones like commodities and gold. And, and those sort of asset classes are the type that we'd expect. Uh, Chris mentioned earlier on, a manager's been given discretion you know, to take more tactical, kind of dynamic positions within their overall mandate. And then if we work to the right-hand side in that bottom row, you know, uh, thinking about asset classes that may you could add to your portfolio to provide some more inflation protection, things like listed infrastructure and um, REITs or indeed kind of, uh, more natural resource equities. So those type of instruments clearly in you know, the short term would exhibit kind of equity-like volatility, but over the long term expected to provide more inflation linkage and protection um, and to, to help insulate your portfolio. We've included floating rate bonds and private debt. So you can see there, um, not an explicit inflation hedge, but linked to that point that Chris made about you know, central bank policy shifting now with um, you know, expected interest rate rises. Uh, coming through over the next year or so, you know, these assets will benefit from that floating rate nature. So, um, you know, in, in the environment where central banks are uh, raising rates to protect or at least, uh, you know, control inflation to some extent, um, those, those assets would benefit. And then back to that point about, you know, private markets, as was mentioned earlier on, um, at the top right there, to, you know, asset classes, depending on, you know, your uh, constraints around liquidity, etc. As an investor, uh, asset classes you could consider as, you um, sustainable private infrastructure or real estate uh, and indeed in, in both in private equity and natural resources to give you kind of a, a liquidity premium plus inflation protection as well so clearly a number of different asset classes there but the, the, the appropriateness would depend on your overall circumstances and um, constraints they have as an investor all right so to sum things up in, in terms of preparing for higher volatility before we go to q and I think you saw earlier on, on, on our dials move to a neutral exposure in equities and growth assets, particularly if you're overweight um, high yield today, that, that looks like that might be um, something to sort of move away from. Evaluating your short-term liquidity needs, cash has a lot of optionality today to the extent that you could, you know, you can hold a little extra is probably a good thing. Consider long-term inflation hedges, basically what, what, what Craig just pointed to. Uh, and then finally, just be be prepared. Um, if you're if you've got those beliefs, policy, and process in place, you can be prepared for uh, for opportunities. So, um, I, I think at this point um, we can uh, thank you for watching today, and we're now going to hand it over to to George's Dyer and um, the discovery for discovering how to uh, make an impact panel. Thank you.